and also, he's from, you've got to remember, he's from America. So, so, um, so we need to be a bit loud and a bit kind of like, yeah, brother, come on. No? Yeah, you can come now, yeah, after I've embarrassed you. Thank you. I didn't hear a single yee-haw out there. All right, all right. That's better. Okay, I feel more comfortable now. Actually, we don't really say that. Um, well, so actually, no, some people do. So, hey, listen, so, so excited to be with you today. We have fallen in. Two years ago, we came to Jersey and just fell in love with the island. And we also went to England, and we went to beautiful places in England, Bath, the Lake District. We went up to, through the Highlands in Scotland. And we came back, and our family said, well, what was your favorite place that you got to visit in the U.K.? And we said, Jersey Island. Yeah. And, and they said, where is that? And I said, exactly. It is the most beautiful place we've ever been. And uh, so when we got an invitation to come back, we just immediately took it. And we're spending a couple days here on the back end of this to just enjoy the island again. Um, although our initial introduction to Jersey was a bit weird, uh, the very first locals we met who discovered, you know, the it was our first time on the island, said, um, have you seen the cows? And we said, no, we have not seen the cows. Well, you must see the cows. And we're thinking, what, are there like two cows somewhere that you're supposed to go see? And then we got introduced to the Jersey cows, told all about them. And, and I guess the worst part of that story is how much we've fallen in love with your ice cream. Uh, <laughs> So immediately we looked for Jersey ice cream, and we were at our very first ice cream purchase. Then you can get like two scoops and a waffle cone, and for 50 pence, soft ice cream on the top. And so I said, however much ice cream you are legally allowed to put on a cone, please do that, because uh, I don't get back here very often. Uh, anyway, we love the island and love you. You are gracious and kind people, and thank you for your hospitality. My wife, Jan, is with me back here, so she can raise her hand. She's back there as well. So um, I listened, I listened to, to Tim's sermon from last week. It was Pentecost, and after I listened to what he was saying, um, I felt really called to deliver this sermon, which might seem to be a weird topic initially. So you're going to get confused out of the gate when I tell you what I'm going to talk about. But I hope if you trust me, by the end of it, you will see where I think the Spirit, I know some of you all have been praying for this service and me in particular today, that the Spirit um, is moving. And so I hope by the end of this, you'll see the connection, although it might take a minute to get there. Um, the text I want us to meditate on is out of Revelation chapter 12, which already makes you a bit worried, I know. Um, so here we go. Revelation 12. Um, and my wife's a theater teacher, so I'm going to read this with a little bit of enthusiasm. And a great sign appeared in the heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and with the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars. And she was pregnant and crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven behind. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and on his head seven diadems and his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and he cast them to earth and the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child he might devour it and she gave birth to a male child one who was to rule the nations with a rod of iron but her child was caught up to God and to his throne and the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God and then a war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. And yet he was defeated for there was no longer a place for them in the heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole earth. He was thrown down to earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now is the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. The one who accuses them day and night before the throne of God. 
And then skipping down to verse 17. And then the dragon became furious with the woman. And he went off to make war against her offspring. So what do you do with a text like that? When I've been out talking about uh, a book I wrote about the devil and these texts uh, that came out last year, it seems like I run into one of two reactions. You know, one reaction from my charismatic and Pentecostal brothers and sisters from Bethel and the Vineyard Movement, they, they know exactly what to do with this text. This text speaks to a lived experience, a very real battle against dark spiritual oppressive forces. They know exactly what to do with that. And yet, sometimes I worry about them a bit. Because I see, it, it almost seems like sometimes you could be tempted into a morbid fascination uh, with that world. Uh, the devil seems to be behind every corner, behind any inconvenience or frustration. I've seen the devil blamed for PowerPoint failures, uh, bad traffic. And, often, and I've often seen people kind of almost compulsively addicted to deliverance ministries and not enjoying a God who breaks every chain. Um, and for a Holy Spirit-filled people, sometimes I don't feel like we're living into the abundant freedom. So I have some concerns over there. But then, you know, I don't know about you, but we're living in a world where it's more secular, more modern. It seems like the devil just doesn't fit in 2017. You know, do you evoke the devil in your corporate boardroom? Sounds like invoking aliens and strange superstitious mythologies and so some of us just kind of feel awkward about it we don't know what to do with it and so we just don't do anything with it and we find ourselves divorced from jesus's struggle against the satan and we face these texts as a bit of an embarrassment so what i want to do today is try to carve out some middle ground between these two perspectives i'm not judging either one but i would like to carve out a middle ground that i think can energize us and to call us into action um, in this war in heaven, which is now, it seems, playing out a great deal, as it says in the text, on earth. So this is going to be a sermon about the devil. I don't know if you've ever sat through a sermon on the devil, but we're going to talk about the devil. And I'm going to do it by going through four names for the devil in Scripture and using those four names to talk about what this fight feels like and looks like in our lives. And so the first name of the devil we're going to go to is uh, Satan. So I don't know if you know this, but Satan comes from the Hebrew means um, adversary or opponent, the one that is against us, that stands in an opponent as an enemy uh, towards us. Um, and it's more of a relationship than a person in the Old Testament. Even God's actions in the Old Testament are described as ha-satan. It's a, you recall Balaam and the donkey, that's the prophets heading off to give a prophecy. Uh, it's a, it, God sends an angel to, to oppose the prophet. And the scripture says he sends the angel to, to be hostan, uh, to stand as an opponent, an obstacle to that prophet. So anything that stands as an opponent or an obstacle to us. I was first kind of converted to this idea um, out in a prison. I teach a Bible study at a maximum security prison in, in Texas where I live. And I remember one night uh, preaching the Beatitudes to the men. I'm going through them, blessed are the poor in spirit. And I hit blessed are the meek. And when I hit blessed are the meek, I got these skeptical looks on the faces of the inmates, which I had never gotten before whenever I talked about the Beatitudes. Every time I've talked about the Beatitudes with religious people, they're all, you know, we love them. We love the Beatitudes. They looked skeptical. And so I stopped and said, you look like you're not buying this. And they said, here's the deal. We get it. We understand. But in this place... Meekness is mistaken for weakness. You know, in this place, if you're meek, you'll get hurt. So we appreciate what you're saying, but that's just not practicable. It's just not wise to do that. And I was really stuck at that moment because I'm leaving in 30 minutes. I don't live in the brutal, violent world they live in, so I didn't feel like I had the moral authority to insist so I just kind of let the matter drop and left, and, and I was deeply disturbed. I remember walking past the barbed wire and the guard towers, standing in the parking lot, watching the West Texas sunset, and, and feeling unsettled in my soul about what had happened, because I had seen the Beatitudes crash into the world, and the car crash wasn't very pretty. And then I realized to myself, are the Beatitudes any less foolhardy 
and insane in the free world where I'm living? I mean, is meekness any way to get ahead in the world? For those of you that work in the corporate sectors, really, how does meekness work in that pool of sharks? Is meekness ever a good idea? And so this is the first vision I want you to have about what what this war in heaven looks like. There is a dark, diabolical current running through the world that makes meekness and kindness and gentleness and love a heroic, almost foolhardy act of resistance. And that fight to love in this world is battle against the Satan. And you guys are experiencing that this morning. You kind of try to love some hard-to-love people among those. They just kind of hurt you by damaging your building. That battle, that fight, and not just for you as a church, you as an individual. Just tally through your mind all the hard-to-love people in your life. The awkward family members, the abusive parent, the spouse who you're struggling with the neighbors you're living in a very difficult political season and i don't know about you but it seems like people are having a hard time loving each other after this election think of those people draw them to mind and swim against the current of hate our second name for the devil um lucifer Now, what's interesting about the word Lucifer, the name Lucifer, is that if you look in your Bibles for the name Lucifer, you won't find it unless you use the King James Version. The King James Version, Lucifer is named once in Isaiah chapter uh, 14. Now, what's interesting about the first naming of Lucifer in the Scripture is that he's not actually naming the, the angel that we see in Revelation. He's actually naming the Babylonian king. The prophet is prophesying against this oppressive king. And here's how it starts. When the Lord has given you rest from your pain and turmoil and the hard service which you were made to serve, you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. And so the Israelites were going to taunt the king of Babylon with these words. How the oppression has ceased and the insolent fury has ceased For the Lord has broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. And then in verse 12, the name Lucifer is invoked. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the dawn. How you are cast down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. Did you hear the name Lucifer in there? Lucifer is the Latin word for morning star or day star. And so when you heard in my reading, O day star, in the Latin, that is, O Lucifer, how you are cast down. O day star. And the reason why I want us to point out the name Lucifer is because Lucifer named a political person in the imagination of Israel, the king of Babylon. And if you read through Revelation, particularly Revelation 18, Satan is identified as the ruler of what? Babylon. And Babylon is described as the city that governs all the nations of the world. When Satan takes Jesus up to the mountain, the temptation isn't sex, drugs, or rock and roll. The temptation is what? All the kingdoms of the world are mine, and I will give them to you if you worship me. And so Satan is described as the God of this world. And the reason why I want us to think about Lucifer this morning is because this allows us to bring in the social and the political and the economic aspects of spiritual warfare. The battle against the Satan isn't just battling against spooky spirits in the air. Is it about things like the homeless on our streets? It is about economic inequality. It is about injustice in the world and refugees. That battle isn't just a political battle in the, in the eyes of Scripture. It's also a very deeply spiritual battle. To illustrate that, let me jump back to Revelation 18. When the city of Babylon finally falls, when this great, wicked, 
political power falls. It's not just a spiritual power. You know why it's not just a spiritual power? Because there's two groups of people that cry out for Babylon. You know who they are? Who weeps for Babylon? The kings of the world and the merchants. Here's what the merchants say in verse 11. And the merchants of the earth, they wept and they mourned for her. Why? Because no one was there to buy what they were selling anymore. Cargo and gold and silver and jewels and pearls and fine linen and purple cloth and silk and scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood and iPhones and all kinds of articles of ivory and on and on and on it goes. And finally at the end, even slaves and human souls. These are the people that weep for Babylon. The people that were making profit off of Babylon. They're sad to see her go. So what does spiritual warfare look like? It's this. Verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sin, and lest you share in her plagues. Come out. Come out of those oppressive systems. That fight is the battle in heaven, a battle against Lucifer, the king of Babylon. Our third name for the devil, Beelzebub. Beelzebub is described in the New Testament as the prince of demons, and Jesus identifies him with uh, Satan. Now, we're not really sure where the name Beelzebub comes from. Um, but our best guess is that he comes from 2 Kings chapter 1. In 2 Kings chapter 1, the king of Israel takes a bit of a spill. He hurts himself. And then he sends off emissaries to get some healing, to get some prayer. Verse 2. Now Ahaziah fell through the lattice of his upper chamber in Samaria, and he lay sick. And so he sent messengers telling them, Go inquire of Baal Zebub the God of Ekron. You see the problem? The king of Israel is hurt. And instead of appealing to Yahweh, he appeals to who? Baal Zebub. Baal is the Canaanite word for Lord, and Zebub is the word for flies. Instead of appealing to Yahweh, he sends off for healing to the Lord of the flies. And we think Baal Zebub is the originating, the origin of where Beelzebub comes from, the chief of demons, the lord of the flies. And so our third aspect about spiritual warfare is simply idolatry. When you're hurt, who do you call on? When you need something, what do you lean on? God or Beelzebub? Now, how do you identify idolatry in your life? I, I have two. These are my two. These are Richard Buck's two quick idolatry identification te you know, tests. Number one, where do you get your self-esteem from? Just ponder that. But, like, what makes you special and significant? Is it corporate success? Money in your bank account, your health, your fitness, your figure, the success of your children. What? The fact that you have been on this island longer than somebody else. I've heard that is an issue here. No, seriously. What do you, what do you lean on to prop yourself up in, the, in, you know, in, a, in this world? What, what is it you... Makes you better than somebody else. Ponder that. Because in that location will be your Lord of the Flies. Another way to identify idolatry is what trumps what. What's the most important? I heard Tim give a call that, hey, we need some people to kind of show out for this walk. Church needs you. But what's going to trump that that day? What trumps what in your life? What, when it ultimately matters and you got to put a priority out there, what is the, 
What's that last card you play that says, no, 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 I got to get into work? Whatever it is that trumps what. I need some prayer time, but I haven't worked out, so I'm going to go work out. I mean, whatever it is, what trumps what? What's the priorities? Spend some time there. It's in those locations. The little Beelzebub's hiding out in the corners of our lives, that that's where we got to fight the battle against the Satan. Our fourth is simply the devil. The name. Devil's different from Satan. Satan means opponent. Devil means accuser. We heard that in Revelation 12, right? The one who accuses us before the throne room of God. We see that role played out in the Old Testament. Satan shows up in the first chapters of Job, and he kind of lays an accusation on Job. He brings accusation. The, some people think the best interpretation of accuser is just the prosecuting attorney, the one who brings the, the case against you. Now, in the Catholic tradition, this is interesting. In the Catholic tradition, when you're being put up for sainthood, canonization, like they recently did for Mother Teresa of Calcutta, and they will actually appoint, the Vatican court will actually appoint a person to be the person who makes the argument why you shouldn't be a saint, which seems to me like the worst job in the world, to be the person that stands in the Vatican court and says, this is why Mother Teresa of Calcutta, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, is just such a horrible, horrible person. I just don't think it's a spiritually healthy role to fulfill. But you know the name of this person. What is the name of this person? Vatican-appointed accuser. They are called the what? The devil's advocate. And that is their job. Their job is to stand in the court and say, why well, you don't deserve sainthood. And the scripture says that this voice stood in heaven, accusing you and I day and night. Which, I don't know about you, is a terrifying prospect. To imagine that I was going to get to heaven and the devil would just be waiting for me. The prosecuting attorney with the file set out on the table. And then I get into the witness stand and the devil says, all right, I got a few questions to ask you about your sins. And I imagine he has this big roll and he just pops it out. All of my stuff. And he says, I'd like to begin when you were six. And you're like, well, no, let's not start at the beginning. I had a difficult brother. Okay, so I hit him. And then you just, and then through your college years, and you're like, let's not bring up that. I was lost for a while. I, mean, I didn't know what I was doing. Just every little thing. And I don't know how long that would take for you or me, but I'm, I assume this would be a long litany. And then at the end, he would slam the briefcase shut and look at me and say, this guy's not getting in. And the good news today is what? That the voice that would have accused you, that did accuse you day and night, has been cast out of heaven. That when we show up there on that last day, there isn't going to be an accuser there. But the hard part, the battle, is that that voice isn't in heaven anymore. God, that voice isn't in God's ear. Where is that voice now? It is on earth waging war amongst us. God's not listening to the voice anymore, but we sure are. We, 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 in fact, become the Satans when we point at each other and say, what are you doing here? Or do those girls who trash the toilets, what are they? We're, we're playing the accuser. And, in fact, the sad thing about the church is that that seems to be the only message the world gets from the church is the, is the devil, a voice of judgment and accusation. They experience the church as the accuser, accusing us before the throne room of God. But you know where the most insidious place the devil is? Where the accusation is found? Here. That voice. 
that brings accusation against you day and night. That voice of you accusing yourself, you playing the devil on sleepless nights with guilt and shame, that voice is very much alive. My friend, uh, Nadia Boltz Weber, who you may know, Lutheran pastor, in her recent book, uh, Accidental Saint, she tells a story. And she, uh, she's a pastor of a church, a small little church. And they were planning their kind of weekend retreat where they were going to invite all the members of the church to stay the night and cook out and spend a lot of time. You guys have things like that, I'm sure, right? And uh, she's going and she's e making the invite list, sending this email to invite all of her church. And she got to John's name. And John was just kind of one of those guys, kind of irritating, needy, demanding. And he was the kind of guy that just had, for whatever reason, just, just kind of had a thing for Nadia, you know, the pastor, kind of some hero worship. And he was just always seeking her out and taking up her time and her energy. And he was just an exhausting kind of person. I know you know nobody like this in your life. <laughs> and he's one of those people. And she tells the story that she got to his name, sending the email invite out to invite for the church weekend away. And she did something. She skipped his name and didn't invite him. A pastor. And then he died a few weeks later. And she had to preach his funeral. And that voice in their head at what she had done to him, the pettiness of it all. And, and here's the thing. What I love about that story is it really is petty. Have you guys not done some petty little meanness? Denied somebody a little act of kindness. We, and it was only upon his death that we, the magnitude, the magnitude of how bad that is. It doesn't seem like a little thing until she has to preach over his body knowing that a couple weeks before she left his name off the church invitation. And so she is racked, as all of us would be racked by guilt and she goes to a friend who's another pastor, and she says, I, I have to confess this sin before I preach his funeral. I cannot get this burden of guilt and shame off of me. And so she, she went over to her friend's house, and she told the whole story, and her friend said, okay, first of all, that was bad. <laughs> you know, like, yes, that was a bad thing to do. And then she said this. Nadia, Jesus died for your sins, even that one. And my assumption is that all of us have that to some degree. Jesus has forgiven me of sins, but what about this one? What about this one? the one you can't forgive yourself for, the one that is still accusing you day and night. You know, the good news is you don't have to forgive yourself. Your salvation is not contingent upon you forgiving yourself because God has already forgiven you. you and you might not forgive yourself. You might go through 20 years of therapy and alcoholism to try to, like, block it out, and you might avoid it and struggle with it your whole life. And listen, all you're doing is just avoiding the abundant life Jesus has for you. But none of that shame or guilt affects what God thinks about you. But that is the hardest battle we fight. The believability in the grace of God. In Ephesians, Paul prays this. He says, I pray that you have the power to comprehend I pray that you have the power to believe. I pray that you have the power to understand, to embrace with your whole being. I pray that you have the power to believe what? How deep and how wide and how high. Like, can you believe that? Some of us can't. Which is why we lack the power to believe it. 
I go out to the prison, and I was talking about the love of God, like you do. And Steve raised his hand. He goes, how can I believe that? Because I have never heard another human being in my life say they love me. My mother never said she loved me. My father never said he loved me. Could you imagine that? Go through your whole life, and you've never had a person look you in the eye and say, I love you. And so Steve lacked the power to believe this. Because he had never had anybody in his life act as a sacramental witness. And by that I mean, what's a sacrament? A visible sign of an invisible reality. He never had a sacramental presence, another human being, look him in the face and say, you are loved. And in that witness that you are loved and a child of God, the love of God becomes more believable. What is the church for? Why are we gathered? To make the love of God believable. Because many of us come in here and don't really believe it. Maybe for most of my sins, but not that one. And there's a world out there that doesn't find it believable. And we gather to witness and become a sacramental sign that God's love is a, a lived reality. And it is transformative. So let me end with one more story. We'll close. During your worship, which was beautiful, by the way, I had tears in my eyes. And this happens to me often when I worship. I saw little girls dancing over in the corner. And it reminded me of Miss Beth. I worship at a church that reaches out to very poor and homeless people. Miss Beth was one of them. She had lived a very hard life. She had been homeless many times. She had struggled for decades with addiction. She had a very troubled and abusive father. She had troubled and abusive histories with men. In the pecking order society, she was on the absolute bottom. And then she found Jesus. And one night, uh, Miss Beth and some other women from that church who had various other troubled histories and homelessness and addictions, and it was Valentine's Day. Do you all celebrate Valentine's over here? It was Valentine's Day. And you know Valentine's Day can be a tough day for some of us. It was a tough day for a lot of those women. And my wife, who is, is one of the most Christ-like people I know, invited those women to come over to our house for a Valentine's Day party. And the message Jana preached into their lives that night was, here's the thing, in the eyes of the world, like we've struggled to find love. And we therefore don't feel lovable. And Jana had went out to the, to the party store and bought these little plastic tiaras that girls would wear during like a little, little party, a little princess party. She had, so she handed out these little plastic, these cheap plastic little girls tiaras and they all put them on and declared themselves beloved daughters of the king that night. And that tiara made the love of God believable for Miss Beth. And so Miss Beth became the evangelist of the tiaras. When she was having a tough day, when she couldn't believe in the love of God, when it became hard again, and the devil was accusing her again that you were just nobody and nothing, she would show up to church with that tiara on. And when she showed up with that princess tiara on, you know she was fighting it. She was fighting the devil that night. She was resisting that message in her head. And Miss Beth would stand in the corner of our worship service with that princess tiara on. And she had a little sway. Janet, she had this beautiful movement that she would just sway. And I remember sitting in the back of that church looking at her dance. And she was no beauty model by anybody's standards. But when I saw Miss Beth in that Princess Tiara dance, it was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I, I don't know how to explain it, but I could see, let me try to do this. You can see the way she saw how God saw her. And she was baptized with grace. And we lost Miss Beth to cancer a few years ago because when you're poor, 
at least in the U.S., you don't get very good health care. I remember stroking her foot when she lay dying. And I said, Miss Beth, you're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. And I see her sometimes in church dancing in a tiara. And she makes the love of God believable to me. And that is good news. Now let's pray. Father in heaven, may your grace surprise us all over again. May we have the power to comprehend how deep and how high and how wide is the love of Christ Jesus for us. And may this church make that believable for each other and for the world. Amen. I forgot I left out. You guys can keep playing. I forgot I left out the point of Pentecost here. So let me end it with this benediction. So what's the connection with Pentecost? Jesus says, I'm going to go away, um, but I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to send back what he calls the paraclete. And you know, in Jewish legal practice, they still use that term paraclete. You know who the Jewish paraclete is in the law in, in the courtroom? It's the defense attorney. It's not the prosecutor anymore. God intercedes for you. Amen and amen.